Good evening. My name is Helen Pudlin, a member of the Wistar Institute Board of Trustees and a member of Wistar's Women in Science Committee. It is absolutely thrilling to gather here virtually this evening to honor Dr. Carolyn Bertozzi, the 2022 Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, who has taken click chemistry to a new level. And we are absolutely thrilled that Dr. Bartosi is our 2022 Wistar Institute Helen Ding King Award winner. Wistar's Women in Science program spotlights the transformative and indispensable role women play in science, the challenges they have met and their profound contributions. Dr. Bart Bartosi is the embodiment of what this award represents. Before presenting the award, I wanna thank the members of the Women in Science Program Committee and our scientific program advisors, Drs. Emilia Escalano and Jesse Villanueva. I also wanna thank our lead sponsors, Connie and Sankey Williams, Glenmead Trust Company and Pfizer, our benefactor sponsors, Marta and Bob Adelson and Cozen and O'Connor, and all of you who have generously supported this initiative and Wistar Science. As many of you know, Wistar is an international leader in biomedical research and home of breakthrough scientific discoveries in cancer, immunology, infectious disease research, and vaccine development. Wistar is America's oldest private independent biomedical research institute. Our scientists are responsible for some of the world's most significant early stage discovery, vaccines, and immunotherapies. When biomedical research was an entirely male-dominated field, Wistar hired its first female scientist, tonight's namesake, Dr. Helen Dean King. She started at Wistar in 1908, and at the time, was the only woman in America to hold a full professorship in research. She spent her whole career at Wistar until her ret retirement in 1950, shattering barriers and making seminal contributions to science, including the development of the laboratory model still used and known today worldwide as the Wistar rat. Named in her memory, the Wistar Helen Dean King Award is presented annually to a transformative scientific pioneer working in the field of biomedical research. Dr. Bertozzi has pioneered a new field of chemistry and her research has opened the door to a new era in medicine. Dr. Bertozzi completed her undergraduate degree in chemistry at Harvard, her PhD at UC Berkeley and postdoctoral work at UC San Francisco a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator since 2000, she came to Stanford University in 2015, where she is a professor and the Baker Family Director of Stanford's Interdisciplinary Institute, ChemH, which stands for Chemistry, Engineering, and Medicine for Human Health. In addition to women winning the 2022 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, she has received many, many other awards for her research, and for training of next generation scientists in chemistry and biology. She was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship in 1999. She received the Lemelson MIT Prize, the Heinrich Weiland Prize, the AC, ACS Award in Pure Chemistry, and the Chemistry of the Future Salve Prize, among other awards far too numerous to name tonight. She is a member of the National Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences, and the National Academy of Inventors, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Scientists. It is a great, great privilege to now present Dr. Carolyn Bertozzi with the Wistar Institute Helen Dean King Award, honoring outstanding women in science for their courage, their leadership, and contributions to advance human health. Dr. Bartosi. Wow, thank you so much. We did it across the country. Isn't that amazing? Technology is improving by leaps and bounds. I'll now turn over the screen 
over to the 2022 Helen Dean King Award winner, Dr. Carolyn Bertozzi, after which we'll engage with audience questions. Please add any questions you have for the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to get to as many of your questions as possible at the end of the program. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you so much, Helen. This is such a wonderful event. Uh, I'm so honored uh, to participate in this event with you all and with all of our listeners. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And you know what's so exciting to me about uh, being recognized with this award is that it's an opportunity to celebrate the life and the career um, of a great and pioneering and ceiling shattering scientists, Helen Dean King. Um, not only did she carve a path that opened doors for many of us and ultimately myself, uh, but she also made an enormous scientific contribution that is still highly impactful today, uh, which is the breeding of the Worcester rat. It's one of the standard model organisms that we use in the laboratory uh, to test ideas about biology and also to evaluate the potential of medicine candidates. And this is certainly how you know, we have come to know the Worcester rat uh, over the course of my career. So with that, um, today I'm gonna talk about basically the sugars that coat the surface of your cells. And this is a subject I first became interested in during my days as a PhD student. Uh, that's when I first learned about this wonderful class of biomolecules. And I should say from the outset that when people hear the word sugar, most of us immediately think about, you know, candy and that white powdery stuff that we put in our coffee. And there is a whole branch of biology around sugar as a, a source of energy and a food source. But there's a different world of biology that we study, which is complex carbohydrates that are made from simple sugars that populate the surface of our cells. And one thing we've learned over the last several decades is that these cell surface sugars are a language that cells use to communicate with each other and to share information. And sometimes those sugars are actually contributing to disease which has opened up new ideas for therapeutic development. So let me start by telling you how I first learned that our cells are coated with sugars. It was during my undergraduate years in the late 1980s when our biochemistry professor at Harvard in the class I was taking analogized cells to the very familiar peanut M&M. And if you bite through the peanut M&M, the cross section is not unlike the way that we depict a cell where there's a sugar coating on the outside. And then you've got this layer of chocolate, which for the cell might be the fats and the lipids. And then all this good stuff in the middle, that's the nut, the protein and everything else. And, and we have all those things in our cells as well. But at that time in the 1980s, when someone would ask that professor, oh, What's the function of the sugar coating? There wasn't much known. And in fact, people would analogize the function similar to that of the peanut M&M. And those of us of a certain age might remember that commercial on TV for M&Ms, which is that the candy coating allows them to melt in your mouth, but not in your hand. Everybody remember that? I certainly do. And basically that would suggest that the sugar coating is just a protective shell. And that was one hypothesis about our cell sugar coating. But nowadays, you know, fast forward another 40 years or so, we know that it's a much more complicated story. First of all, the structures of these sugars on the surface of our cell are complicated and diverse. And they're dynamic, they're in motion. So I like to think of them as long branches and trees and shrubs that are moving and swaying as the wind blows. And if you had a tiny litter, little helicopter that allowed you to fly just above the surface of the cell, when you look down, it might look like the surface of the planet Earth, where you have giant redwood trees in the forest and open spaces with grass and shrubs. 
And the sugars on our cell surfaces create this kind of a rich landscape. But it's not random. It turns out that these sugars have discrete structures and those structures allow the cell to communicate with the outside world. So one of the very first discoveries in the field of sugar biology, and by the way, we have a technical term for that, we call the field glycobiology, where glyco is a Greek prefix that means sugar. And back in the 1950s, physicians made the discovery that the sugars on our cells actually define our blood type. So many listeners probably know their blood type. And if you don't, I would go look that up or try and figure it out because it's good to know. But some of us are blood type O, and I'm one of those people. And by definition, a person who is blood type O has a particular type of complex carbohydrate structure on the surface of their blood cells. It's a structure made up of three building blocks. So there's this black building block here. This is a chemical structure of that sugar. Then there's a different sugar in green and a different sugar in blue, and they're all linked together in a certain way. And that structure is blood type O. But then some of us are blood type A. And blood type A people have an enzyme. And that enzyme can take this red sugar and add it to the blood type O structure to create this larger blood type A structure. And I don't have that enzyme. That's why I'm blood type O. I can't make the blood type A structure. And then there's the blood type B. Those people have a slightly different enzyme and that enzyme can take the green sugar and add it to the O structure to make the B structure. And if there's any chemist in the audience that person might be walking through the details of the A structure and the B structure, and they might notice that they're almost identical. There's just one little chemical group that's different. It happens to be this OH group here versus this ACHN group here. That is the only chemical difference. And for a chemist, this is a tiny little difference, but for your immune system, this is night and day. So if a person who's blood type A accidentally gets a blood transfusion from a donor who's blood type B, that recipient will raise an immune reaction against the blood type B blood because it looks foreign and that could kill the person. So understanding the blood groups, the structures, and how the immune system reacts to these complex carbohydrates allowed people to figure out how to do blood transfusions safely. You need a donor that's a match to the blood type of the recipient. So that big discovery from the previous century set the stage for this field of glycobiology as one that might be very important for human medicine. And that's why I got interested in this field back now more than 25 years ago, and I've been working in it ever since. Now, one of the reports in glycobiology that caught my attention and this report actually dates back to the 1960s, but was repeated again and again and again over the next half century, is that the structures of sugars on cancer cells are quite different from the structures on the healthy cells that they derived from. And one of these cancer-specific changes in cell surface sugars is the overproduction of complex carbohydrates that terminate with this particular simple sugar building block that's called sialic acid. And by the way, many of the listeners might be familiar with the term acid, and we think of acids as being corrosive substances, but that's not what this is. Sialic acid, it just happens to have acid in the name, but this is just a sugar, but it's a very particular type of sugar where our normal healthy cells will always have some sialic acid, but I like to think of it as a well-manicured garden of sialic acid, just the right amount. And for some reason that wasn't known until quite recently, 
When the healthy cell becomes a cancer cell and the cancer cell starts to form a tumor, those cancer cells undergo an increase in the abundance and the density of these sialic acid sugars. And we were very interested in why that might occur. So about 15 years ago, there was a big breakthrough in the field of cancer immunology. And some very important contributors to this field are working right there at the Wistar Institute and at UPenn. So this is probably very familiar to the scientists in your local environment. But what we now know is that your immune system plays a very important role protecting you from cancer. And the way it works is you have white blood cells. Those are your immune cells. And they're coursing through your body, through your blood vessels, pumped by your heart. And as they course through the body, they sample all of your other cells one by one. And it's almost as if they're tasting them. The way they do this is these green fuzzy immune cells will dock onto a target cell and they're sampling the merchandise. And they can tell whether that underlying cell is a healthy cell or a diseased cell like a cancer cell. With a little bit more detail, I'm showing a cartoon that depicts what we call the synapse or the junction between those circulating immune cells and the target cancer or healthy cell that they're sampling. And the way that they sample is through the interaction of receptors on the immune cell. These are proteins anchored to the surface of that immune cell. We call them receptors. And they're binding molecules that are on the surface of the cancer cell. Some of those receptors on the immune cell are what we call activating receptors. And what they are looking for are molecules on the target cell that are indicators of damage. And if there's enough of these activating receptors and damage signals that are interacting with each other at the synapse, that triggers a response by the immune cell. That's why we call them activating. And what the immune cell will do in response to that signal is launch an attack at that underlying target cell and literally like firing a missile, it will just kill that target cell. So if this is a cancer cell, and everything's working properly, the damage signal trigger the immune cell to kill, and that protects us from cancer. But this is a dangerous capability that the immune cell has, because what if the immune cell makes a mistake and accidentally starts to kill healthy cells? That does happen, and when that goes out of control, we end up with autoimmune diseases. Those are diseases where our own immune system is damaging us. So our immune cells have a built-in mechanism to try to protect from autoimmune reactions. That's the job of these other receptors on the immune cell called the inhibitory receptors. These proteins are looking for molecules on the cancer cell that are signatures of good health. And if there's enough of the good health signals binding the inhibitory receptors, that shuts the immune cell down and puts it to sleep and sends it on its merry way to the next target cell. So what we discovered, and what I, when I say we, I mean the field of cancer immunology, is that you can potentiate or increase the activity of your immune cells as killers of cancer by blocking the interaction between inhibitory receptors and healthy signals that a cancer cell might put on the cell surface as part of its mechanism to escape recognition by the immune system. And the so-called first-generation immune therapies that have now been on the market for almost 10 years are essentially monoclonal antibodies that bind either the receptor or the signal it binds to and just block this inhibitory interaction. So let me show you an example of some clinical data from first-generation cancer immune therapies that got the, the whole world really excited about 
this approach to treating cancer. These are data from a phase three clinical trial where two different immune therapies were tested on their own and also in combination with each other. And these immune therapies are monoclonal antibodies that block receptors on T cells. T cells are one type of immune cell. And the receptors they block are inhibitory receptors called either PD-1 or CTLA-4. And sometimes people refer to these two inhibitory receptors as the T cell checkpoint receptors. And in this clinical trial, patients with advanced metastatic melanoma, so that's skin cancer, very dangerous form of cancer. These are patients that 100% of them would have succumbed to this illness without these treatments. But when they were treated with antibodies that block CTLA-4 or PD-1 or a combination of two antibodies that block one or the other, now some of the patients survived for the long term and were actually cured of this otherwise fatal diagnosis. So you can see patients treated with one antibody or the other, you know, some of the patients did not survive, but after three years, between 30 and 50% of the patients were still alive and in remission. And when the two medicines were combined with each other, over half of those patients were still alive at the three-year mark. Again, totally unprecedented for advanced skin cancer. So these kinds of data back around 2010 to 2012 launched this new revolution in oncology where we think about ways that we can jack up the activity of our immune system in the battle against cancer. And as you might imagine, all the major pharmaceutical companies with programs in oncology gone on this and developed medicines that target these T-cell checkpoint receptors. And the first four actually target the receptor on the T-cell, and the last three target the ligands that these receptors bind to on the cancer cell. But at the end of the day, there's now a whole bunch of medicines that a patient can try if they have an otherwise recalcitrant cancer. So this was such a big deal that when these drugs were approved, all the major newspapers and magazines and, and science journals um, wanted to share the good news. And, you know, issues of science and nature were dedicated to these breakthroughs in cancer immunotherapy. And even the magazines at the supermarket checkout line were touting cancer immune therapy as the potential magic cure we've all been waiting for. New scientists went so far as to call cancer immune therapy a penicillin moment, which is a pretty profound thing to say since penicillin, you know, was a cure for bacterial infections that were killing people a century ago. And some very famous people made the news because they were cured by these treatments. For example, former president Jimmy Carter had advanced melanoma that had metastasized to his brain. And he was one of the early patients to get an immune therapy prescription, and he was cured, which was a remarkable thing. And not surprisingly, a few years later in 2018, my good friend Jim Allison, who was formerly at UC Berkeley at the same time that I was, together with Tasuku Hanjo, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for discovering the foundational biology on which these medicines were based. So it was a very exciting time to be thinking about cancer immune therapy, but everyone knew that there was a lot more work to do because although some patients had dramatic, miraculous responses to these medicines, the majority of patients did not benefit. So you can see even from these data in metastatic melanoma, which is one of the types of cancers where a person has the best shot at a cure with these medicines. But even then, only about half of the patients in this clinical trial benefited from the treatment. And there are now FDA approvals of these medicines in other types of cancer, but the percent of patients that benefit is even lower. So for example, patients with non-small cell lung cancer can take these medicines, but 
only about 11% of those patients have progression-free survival increases at the one-year mark. And the numbers get even lower as you get to these other types of cancer. And then there are types of cancers for which these drugs have been tried in clinical trials, but patients did not benefit. So from this first phase of cancer immune therapy development, the conclusion is that there are probably other pathways that cancers are using to inhibit immune cells. And what are those pathways? And can we make drugs against those other pathways so that the patients who don't respond to the first generation might have a shot at responding to a next generation? And this is where glycobiology comes in. Because as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, over half a century ago, it was observed that tumor cells often have very high levels of sialic acid on their cell surface carbohydrates compared to the healthy cells that surround the tumor tissue. And nobody knew why that might happen. But when the story of how the immune system intersects with cancer came out, we were able to form a hypothesis. Because it turns out there is a family of receptors on immune cells that bind sialic acids. And they go by the name of the sialic acid binding immunoglobulin, which is what IG stands for, like lectins. And that's a big mouthful. So we use the acronym SIGLEX to describe this family of immune cell receptors. There's about 14 of them in humans, and they each have a number. So SIGLEC1, SIGLEC2, SIGLEC3, and so on and so forth. They are all anchored to the membrane. So they're on the surface of the immune cell. And if the membrane is this yellow line, then the stuff above the line is what's facing outside the cell. And the stuff that's below the line is what's facing inside the cell. And each of these members of the SIGLEC family can be found on a variety of different types of immune cells. And the different flavors of immune cells are shown below here. There's all these different types. And all of them can contribute to anti-cancer immunity in their own way. Now, what struck us about the structures of the SIGLEX is how similar they were to the well-known T-cell checkpoint receptor PD-1. Remember, that's one of those inhibitory receptors against which we now have several FDA-approved antibody drugs that block this receptor from binding to its ligand. And the similarity between PD-1 and the SIGLEC receptor family is best understood by focusing on the parts of these proteins that are inside the cell or below the yellow line. Because PD-1 has regions of its protein that are inside the cell with these acronyms ITIM and ITSM. And these are acronyms that immunologists use to describe the part of the protein that allows it to shut down the immune cell. Well, it turns out that many members of this sialic acid binding SIGLEC family have that same biochemical mechanism inside the cell where they can also shut down the immune cells that they populate in the same way that PD-1 can shut down the T cell. So we drew this very simple analogy between the PD-1 biology that inhibits the T cell and the SIGLEC biology that might be inhibiting lots of immune cells. So the SIGLECs on an immune cell, we hypothesized, could be binding these sialic acids on the cancer cell surface. And that interaction might trigger that inhibitory response, just the same way that PD-1 binding to its ligand, which is called PDL1 on the cancer cell, that it can shut down the T cell. So inside these cells, these two different types of receptors behave basically identically. The only difference is that the SIGLEX are binding sialic acid. So we tested this hypothesis experimentally, and it turns out that this was absolutely the case 
And we published that finding uh, back in 2014. And since that time, many other labs have drawn similar conclusions in different types of cancer experimental models. But the long and the short of it is that this SIGLEC family of uh, receptors, we think, is a really good target for cancer immune therapy. So here's the model that we proposed. The immune cell, when things are working well, is able to recognize those damage signals on the cancer cell. And now I'm gonna revert back to you know, the analogy of sugars as tasting good and tasting sweet. So imagine the immune cell is tasting the cancer cell and it tastes bad, so it launches the bombs and kills the cell. That's good news for the person. However, what if that cancer cell has very high densities of the sugar, sialic acid? Now that SIGLEC receptor can taste the sugars and it makes the cancer cell taste a lot better. And that signals to the immune cell that everything's okay. Don't kill the cell, move along. And that's bad for the person. So what we wanna do is take away the sialic acids and make that cancer cell taste bad again. Another way to analogize this is think about your, fa your favorite actor. And I'm gonna pick on Michelle Pfeiffer here because I'm a child of the 1980s. But you know when she's performing in most of her films, she looks fabulous. She's dressed up and imagine she's wearing a beautiful outfit coated with sialic acid. She looks amazing. But take away the sialic acid and now she might look quite different to you if you're an immune cell. And maybe you can see her for what she really is, which is a cancer cell. So how do you make a medicine that takes the sialic acids off of cancer cells? We like to think of this as a medicine that functions like a molecular lawnmower that can literally mow sialic acids off of cancer cells. Imagine parking that medicine on the cancer cell, turning it on, and off go the sialic acids. Now that cancer cell cannot engage the SIGLEX, cannot put those immune cells to sleep, and it gives your immune cell the chance to recognize it as damaged and kill it. So we made a molecule that is essentially a cancer-specific lawnmower. The molecule has two parts. One part, which is this pink part of the molecule, and it's a big protein molecule. This pink part is an antibody, and ideally a monoclonal antibody that binds something that's very specific to cancer cells. It turns out that many such antibodies are already known and some of them are FDA approved drugs all by themselves. And what we do is we chemically attach an enzyme called a sialidase to a part of the antibody that won't interfere with its cancer targeting. And a sialidase is an enzyme that has the ability to cut sialic acids off of the things that lie beneath them. And there's a bunch of these known sialidases in nature. So I thought this would give me a chance to mention a different area of science in my laboratory, and it happens to be the area of science for which I received the Nobel Prize, um, because another hat that I wear is as a chemist that invents new reactions that we call bioorthogonal chemistries. And one of the superpowers of these chemistries is they allow us to take large very complicated molecules and stick them together chemically. And so we used bioorthogonal chemistries to attach sialidase enzymes to antibodies. And there were two chemistries we took advantage of. I won't go through the gory technical details, but it suffices to say we have a technology where we can introduce a chemical group called an aldehyde onto a position that we want on a monoclonal antibody, which is what this Y shape denotes. That aldehyde allows us to do a bioorthogonal chemical reaction called the pictet spengler ligation. And that chemistry converts the aldehyde to this more complicated molecule that has three nitrogens at the end. That's a group we call the azide. 
In parallel, we took the sialidase, which is this little Pac-Man shape, and we did some chemistry on the sialidase to introduce this exotic chemical group, which has a cyclooctane ring. And that chemical group will react with the azide in a second bioorthogonal chemistry called copper-free click chemistry that ultimately stitches two copies of the enzyme onto the tail of this antibody. So once we had made these antibody sialidase conjugates, we were able to test their biological activities in a number of different settings. But most importantly, we found that they can blunt the growth of tumors in a variety of mouse cancer models. And here's one example of some data that we acquired in collaboration with an oncologist named Heinz Laubli at University Hospital in Basel, Switzerland, and his grad student, Michael Stanzak. This is a model in which Michael took a mouse breast cancer cell type and engineered it to express a marker that's found on human breast cancers. Then he grew those cancers in the mouse mammary fat pad, so breast cancer in the mouse breast, and treated those mice with different reagents to see if he could basically prevent tumor growth and kill the tumors. So you're looking here at an increase in the size of those tumors as a function of days, where each of these triangles is a point in time at which we injected into these mice either just a saline solution called PBS or an antibody on its own, which is called TRAS, or a conjugate between that same antibody and a sialidase at two different doses. And as you can see, the antibody on its own had no effect on the growth of these tumors. They grew just as if we had injected the animals with salt water. But when the animals were injected with the antibody conjugated to a sialidase, now the tumors had a very difficult time growing. And that's because the immune cells of the mouse were killing those cancer cells. So this gave us the confidence that it was time to make a candidate for human clinical trials. And to do that, we formed a company uh, that goes by the name of Pallion Pharmaceuticals. And by the way, Pallion is located out on the East Coast. It's just outside of Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the scientists at Pallion did some wonderful work to basically re-optimize the structure so that we could develop it more easily as a human medicine. So you can see that on the left-hand side is the prototype that we made in my academic lab, where we chemically connected a sialidase from a bacterium to a human antibody. At Pallion, they have figured out, first of all, how to switch to a human sialidase, which is better for human medicine. And they also changed the structure where instead of having two enzymes attached to a full antibody, which is a very large molecule, they took off one domain of the antibody, you can call it this right-hand arm, and replaced that with the enzyme so that the overall molecule looks more like an unmodified antibody. So this is the structure that we're gearing up to test in humans, in cancer patients, and we're at the point where we will be launching a phase one slash two clinical trial sometime in the middle of 2023. So we will be able to test this idea in humans soon enough. So with that, hopefully I've given you a sense of the kind of work we do in my lab, how we try to make new kinds of medicines that are based on what we learn about glycobiology. And bioorthogonal chemistry was a supporting role in this particular story, but it was the focus of the first decade or so of my lab's research at UC Berkeley. And I'm grateful that we have those technologies to accelerate this more recent work that I mentioned today. So with that, I'll thank all of my past and present trainees. There's several hundred of them, can't put them all on one slide, but this is the composition of my current lab at Stanford and the students and the postdocs and the undergrads and the staff are working away, trying to make new kinds of medicines based on glycoscience. With that, thank you very much for this opportunity and I'm happy to answer questions.
Thank you so much, Dr. Bertossi, for that brilliant presentation. We are so excited and thrilled to have you today with us. And welcome, everybody. I think you will all agree with me that Dr. Bertossi epitomizes the true meaning of the Helen Dean Keen Award. So we're thrilled to have you today with us. Um, my name is Jesse Villanueva. I am a faculty member here at the Western Institute. I'm also the Associate Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And together with my colleague, Amelia Escolano, we are uh, the Scientific Advisors for the Women in Science Program. Amelia? Hello, everyone. Uh, Dr. Dr. Bertozzi, uh, thank you very much uh, for a wonderful presentation, such an inspiring uh, presentation, and a big congratulations uh, for your Nobel Prize and, and also for uh, now for this Helen Dean King uh, Award. Uh, my name is Amelia Escolano. I'm an assistant professor at the Wistar Institute, and uh, as Jesse said, I'm also a scientific advisor uh, for our women uh, and sci in science uh, program here at Wistar. Uh, so Jesse and I uh, are going to be uh, leading the Q&A today. Uh, we received uh, multiple questions in advance to your presentation, and we also have uh, a series of questions uh, that uh, listeners were adding to the chat. Uh, so I, I can start. Um, I see that um, a couple of listeners were wondering between uh, the differences uh, in glycosylation be between different uh, cancer cell types. Uh, so specifically, uh, someone is asking, is, is, is there different uh, uh, forms of sugars on cancer cells? Are these sugars universal to all, all these cancer cells? And uh, also, um, uh, as the cancer cells are very heterogeneous, are they universal binding sites where a particular monoclonal antibody can attach? Or, or, or like it's also like the, the listener is also suggesting if you are using specific antibodies for uh, specific cancer cell types or you use uh, cocktails of, of monoclonal antibodies. Thank you. Um, these are great questions, very insightful. And I'll start with the first one, which is, um, are there different forms of sugars on different cancer cells or is there like a universal <laughs> signature? There's definitely a lot of heterogeneity. Um, and basically the way that we've been teasing this out, and this is the work primarily at Pallion, um, is by making reagents that are basically soluble forms of the Siglec receptor carbohydrate binding domains that we use to do immunohistochemistry. So we can take patient biopsy samples from, from cancers that are resectable and cut slices of them and stain them with different soluble Siglec reagents. And if a Siglec reagent binds to the tissue and lights it up, then we know that there are sugars there that are binding to that Siglec. But it's difficult to dig into the weeds and figure out what's all the details of those chemical structures of those sugars, because that's just a really hard or experimentally challenging question to answer. Sequencing sugars is a billion times more difficult than sequencing, for example, DNA or even proteins. But using the Siglex themselves as staining reagents for immunohistochemistry gives you a functional readout that that cancer has ligands for that Siglex. And when Pallion does those experiments, what they find is there are certain types of cancers that tend to express ligands that bind particular Siglex. For example, 80% of melanoma patients will have ligands for Siglec 7, Siglec 9, and Siglec 3, all three of them. Okay, that's a preponderance. Whereas patients with other types of cancers, for example, head and neck cancer, a far fewer percentage of those types of patients have ligands for Siglecs. Patients with ovarian cancer often express high levels of ligands for one particular Siglec, whereas patients with pancreatic cancer tend to express ligands for a different Siglec. And you can stratify patients based on their Siglec ligand expression patterns, you know, which is something we're interested in doing as we enroll them in our clinical trials. So the bottom line is there is heterogeneity. We don't know all the chemical details of the sugar structures, but we can get a functional readout of which Siglecs might be most important for immune modulation by those tumors. And that I think is, is helpful to understand the biology. 
The Thank second you. question I think had to do with, can you make monoclonal antibodies that block the ligands, the sugars themselves? I yeah, but so, so the question was like, if, if these glycans have some common common epitopes, let's say, uh, so that can be all these different glycans or like cancer cell types could be uh, targeted by the same mon same monoclonal antibody, or if you uh, are considering cocktails uh, for different types of, yeah. Sure. Um, right now, we're leveraging several decades of knowledge about different cancer types and the antigens they express. So for example, I showed the, the, that particular antibody that we tested in that model is an antibody called trastuzumab. And it's an FDA approved antibody that's used to treat breast cancers and gastric cancers with high levels of an antigen called HER2. And we already know from lots of clinical data and several approved drugs that that antibody gives good selectivity for cancer cells by binding HER2, okay? So that's, that's well established. So we're using that antibody, this FDA approved antibody as the first target with our sialidase because we already know, right? That it's a successful antibody in a number of breast cancer patients. Um, likewise, we have other cancer types where we're leveraging other antibodies that are already approved drugs and already well known to bind antigens that are cancer selective. Okay, so um, we're not using cocktails of antibodies. We're using specific antibodies that already are well known to target specific types of cancers. And you can screen a patient. You can screen their tumor biopsy samples to make sure their cancer has this antigen before you prescribe this type of drug. Now, with regard to the sugars that the SIGLEX are binding, one thing all the SIGLEX share in common is they're binding sugars capped with sialic acid. But below the sialic acid, there's a lot of variation and different SIGLEX have different preferences. So the SIGLEX are not redundant with each other. They all require the sialic acid, but then there's more to it than that. So the reason we like the sialidase approach is you don't need to know precisely which SIGLEX are the most important SIGLEX. You don't need to know whether that particular tumor has more ligands for SIGLEX9 than it has for SIGLEX7 or SIGLEX3. All you need to know is if SIGLEX are involved and you take the sialic acids off, you will deprive all of those receptors of their high affinity ligands. So this, the sialic acid is a node. It's not the whole story, but it's a node. And if we hit that node with the sialidase, I think we can have a profound effect on the immune system. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Bertosi. So we have two other interesting questions here. One, is there any correlation between SIGLEX uh, expression and resistance to checkpoint inhibitors? Yes, there is. <laughs> you know, from the outset, our hypothesis was that patients that don't respond to checkpoint inhibitor therapy, it might be because SIGLEX and sialic acids are more important axes of immune suppression in those patients. And at Pallion, they actually have some translational data where they got a collection of tumor biopsy samples from patients at Mass General Hospital. And these are patients that were treated with immune therapy with checkpoint inhibitors, and some of them responded and some of them didn't. And the non-responders are the ones that have the highest levels of SIGLEC ligands on their tumors. And conversely, the patients that do respond to these checkpoint inhibitors tend to have lower levels of SIGLEC ligands. So that's a correlation. It doesn't prove causation, but our hypothesis is that patients that don't respond to checkpoint inhibitors have a shot at responding to sialidases or SIGLEC ligand degraders. If you combine the two, you might get an even more profound effect, an even broader response profile. And there's a, our collaborator, Heinz Laubly, he just put out a paper in Science Translational Medicine just about a week ago, uh, showing that these engineered sialidases can cure a certain fraction of mice from cancers. The checkpoint inhibitors can cure a certain fraction of mice. But if you combine them, you can cure almost every mouse in these cohorts. So I think combination therapies with the blockers of PD-1 and CTLA-4 are gonna be really interesting to look at. Fantastic. And is there any concern about potential toxicity when you use a combination of the two? 
Well, toxicity is always a concern, whether you're co combining medicines or testing them on their own. And we already know that the first generation immune therapies have typical side effects that are autoimmune in nature, right? Because you're disrupting a receptor whose natural function it is to prevent autoimmune reactivity. And if you block that receptor, you should expect some autoimmune side effects. And that's exactly what people see. So I think with our medicines, with our sialidases, we should look carefully for autoimmune side effects. I wouldn't be surprised if they arise over time. And with the combinations, it's true that those side effects might be further exacerbated, but the human clinical trials will tell us this. Looking forward to see what happens. So we have also um, a series of questions about uh, your personal experience as a, as a scientist, as, as a woman in science. So um, um, people want to know, uh, for example, what would you tell the younger you uh, after this uh, remarkable accomplishment? And what would you tell uh, young scientists and specifically uh, women in STEM uh, that are pursuing a career in, in science? <laughs> Well, that's a lot, uh, you know, um, a lot of people have asked me that, right? Since the Nobel Prize announcement, uh, assuming I would have some wisdom <laughs> to share for younger generations. And first of all, I should say, um, prizes are nice and exciting and can be life-changing like this one, but they don't drive you. Uh, they're never a goal. They're idiosyncratic and unpredictable and, you know, nobody should expect to win prizes for their science. Um, I think really what you should focus on as a scientist is what can you do for the benefit of humanity, right? How can you use your passion for science uh, to make the world a better place? And there's so many ways that you can improve the world with science. And biomedicine is just one. There's lots of other ways as well. There's all kinds of problems, climate change, you know, inequalities in the world. And science, I think, can be really put to good use to make humanity suffer less. Chemistry in particular, you know, I always felt that um, when the world is on fire, you know, <laughs> when the world is in trouble, chemistry often comes to the rescue, as we did with COVID vaccines and therapeutics and, and so on and so forth. Um, so if you're a young scientist and, you know, you have an aptitude for science and an interest in science and a passion for science, Think about what are the unmet needs in the world. And sometimes the unmet needs are very tangible solutions to problems like medicines, but sometimes the unmet needs are knowledge. Sometimes we just don't know enough in a particular area to be able to solve problems yet. So even just contributing to the base of knowledge for humanity is, is an enormous contribution to the world. Uh, and if you focus on that and just do the highest quality science you can do with the most diligence and the most attention to detail, good things will follow. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Maybe, maybe Jesse, let me uh, follow up on that. Um, because like we have a lot of people interested in this personal uh, experience. So um, can you tell us about like a difficulty or a roadblock that you found in, in your career and, and how do, how did you go through that? And what did you learn uh, from that? How how that made you stronger and, 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 and better? Well, like everyone, you know, I've, I've had my challenges and some of my challenges have been specific to research projects I worked on that weren't going so well and so on. And, and others, other challenges were due to external forces like gender discrimination. And I'm, I'm a lesbian. So also, you know, discrimination based on homophobia. I mean, these are all problems I encountered throughout my career and um, was able to overcome uh, to some extent. Uh, I was lucky because I came into my adulthood at a time when um, the culture in our country was changing and there was at least lip service to a desire to have more women in science, if not much action, but at least there was talk about it. Uh, and also the world, at least the US, was changing with regard to the rights and opportunities of queer people like me. So I'm very lucky because if I had been born even 10 years earlier, uh, 
doors wouldn't have been open the way that they were for me. And the doors are even wider open now, which is wonderful for younger scientists breaking into the field. Um, but there were times when I felt kind of locked out of doing the kinds of science I was interested in. And I had to find back doors and side doors to make my way in. Uh, and it was frustrating at the time, but I think there was a lesson there. And the lesson for me was sometimes you can't get the opportunity that you're thinking of in, in, the, in the near term. And if you can't, then you should look for what opportunities are available to you and just get on that bus and go. Because an opportunity is an opportunity, even if it's not the one you had in mind, <laughs> it is an opportunity. And don't be afraid to take opportunities that you hadn't foreseen as being right for you and just give it a go. Um, and I did that as an undergraduate and it allowed me to stay in the chemical sciences and eventually make my way to organic chemistry, which was my real passion. But I was not able to break into that field for several years of trying, um, but I found a back door and managed to get my way in. This is in the 1980s. Then later as an assistant professor, I had another difficult period of time where I didn't have a whole lot of support uh, from my senior colleagues in my department. And I questioned whether I was going to last in my job. <laughs> you know, I wasn't sure. Um, and what happened was um, I kept it to myself for a long time. And then eventually one evening I was, you know, in a conversation with some people from a different department. And I just bared my soul and I told them my frustration and, you know, my questions about whether I was in the right job. And it turned out some of those other faculty from this other department decided to step up and be my advocates. And they really helped me at a time when I had a hard time finding the support I needed from my more immediate colleagues. So the lesson there is all of us need advocates to help us along the way. We need people who can help clear the debris that might get thrown in front of us, either intentionally or unintentionally. And sometimes those advocates are not the people in your backyard. Right, Those advocates you might find from a more distant location, but they're out there and make sure you have them. Thank you very much for, for sharing that experience. I'm sure that's very helpful and inspiring for everyone. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Bertossi. Let me echo Amelia's words. Um, your inspiration, not only for the science you're doing, but also for your personal experiences and for being so candid to share them with us, especially for those of us who are underrepresented in, in biomedical research, um, that is super, super inspiring. So thank you so much. If you allow me to go back to a, a scientific question, I think um, one that we're curious about is whether there is anything known in terms of the microbiome and sugars. Is there any impact on changes in the microbiome and how the sugars are expressed in our cells? You know, that is such a frontier bleeding edge of science right now. Um, but I think the smart money says, yes, there probably is a rich glycobiology around the microbiome and interaction between those microbes and the host that they benefit. Um, and just as a case in point, you know, I have colleagues at Stanford that study the genetics of the microbiota and have found that there's more glycobiosynthesis genes in those microbiota species than in any other sector of bacteria. So they are obviously making a lot of interesting sugar molecules. Also, your gut is lined with complex carbohydrates on a class of glycoproteins called mucins. And mucins are the major constituents of mucus. And we all know that there's a lot of mucus in your GI tract. Those mucins interact with bacteria in a number of ways. They can affect how the bacteria attach to the gut cells, the epithelial cells of the gut. They also can be food for bacteria and bacteria produce enzymes that digest these mucins. So when a person has a deficit in gut mucins, this can cause a dysbiosis of the microbiota. So there is a glycoscience there. And I would encourage people to think about studying that because there's a lot we don't know. Thank you, Dr. Bertossi. We have 
a ton of questions and a lot of congratulations and um, expression of great talk, but we unfortunately have to let Dr. Bertossi go. She has another um, commitment after these, but we are so grateful for your time. And again, you are truly an inspiration to all of us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. I'm so Thank proud you. to have this rat. This is beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in closing, let me thank everyone for joining us today. It has been a wonderful time having you all here with us. And please do save the, your the next event in your calendars. It's Thursday, April the 27th next year. And we will have another inspiring woman, Maria Elena Botazzi, who has been a, a drive force in the development of the COVID vaccine, given out for the entire world without a patent. So please do join us for the next event. And thank you so much, Dr. Bertossi, and everybody for joining us. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.